sitting here with Ken Lin, the founder of Credit Karma. Um, I know when I moved over to covering this, this whole realm, FinTech, from covering Wall Street, um, I think a lot of the conversation at that point was on, you know, Lending Club, uh, so, some of these other brand names, Venmo, obviously PayPal, that sort of stuff. But I kept being drawn back to and, and hearing a lot about um, Credit Karma uh, it just just because of the, the sheer numbers. I mean, I think at that point, you guys had 60 million um, members, account holders, uh, people had signed up. I mean, that just dwarfed anything else in this space in terms of the number of people uh, who you were dealing with. So uh, I guess the place to start with that is um, how did you get that many people and uh, how do you make money from them? <laughs> sure. So for, for, for people who are unfamiliar with uh, Credit Karma, you know, we, we're a business that's been around for 10 years now. I think to your point, uh, in the last five years or so, we've actually added about 70 million users on the platform just in the last five years alone. Uh, but the business model really predicated on this idea that consumers are desperately craving an understanding of their credit, their finances. And I would argue for a long time that's been really a, a, an area that's been ignored by many financial services companies, by many startups. So our approach is pretty straightforward. Give people access to their information, give them education, and really focus on giving them better products based on that data, right? I mean, I think that's the trend that you see in the space is that data really matters, right? So whether you take a look at a Google, a Facebook, even an Amazon, you know, this idea of data being the, the ultimate driver of the, you know, sort of the, the next wave of the economy, I think is pretty powerful. And at Credit Card, we focused on how do we do that in the financial services world? So our business model is to show people their credit scores, help them understand how to improve it, let them know when they're overpaying for a loan product. And when we do that, uh, we make revenue from, from uh, facilitating a loan, consumers should save money, banking partners should get a new customer. Business model is pretty straightforward. I would sort of add the last thing that we don't do, which I think a lot of people think we do, is sell consumer data, right? We're in the business of uh, being a consumer advocate. We're in the business of making sure people are in the right loan products. So you guys um, obviously began with the credit score. Uh, that's the sort of, I think, basic product that most people are probably familiar with. Um, recently, you've been moving to do a lot of other stuff as well, adding on to that. Um, I guess, take us through what the big ones are at this point that you've added on recently, or the, the big one, if you wanted to focus on <laughs> Sure. So, you know, uh, in, I think, October or November-ish of last year, we actually announced our move into the tax base. So I think that uh, is very aligned with our strategy, with this idea that Data is tremendously important. If you think about what data is today and really the outlook for us is that credit is a view into the liability side of a consumer's balance sheet. Tax is basically a view into the income and asset side. And with that, you have a very powerful picture of how consumers are uh, thinking about their finances, when they're paying too much, when they're perfectly priced. Uh, so that's the opportunity for us. So we thought, well, that combination of data is tremendously powerful. So we thought strategically it was a great checkbox for us. Um, I think moreover, there, for us, you know, we have this really strong mission at Credit Card, which is to help people move forward in their lives. And we looked at the sector and said, wow, here's an industry that looked a lot like credit scoring 10 years ago when we entered, which is notably, you know, 10 years ago, if people remember that credit scores were quote unquote free, but no one actually made it free, right? Free meant $20 a month historically. And we changed that, I think, over the course of the last 10 years. And we think that there's certainly an opportunity in parallel in taxes, because everyone today uh, claims that you know, there are no filing costs or you know, tax return software that's free. But the reality is, just like in credit scoring 10 years ago, the fine print is if you have a state return, if you make more than $62,000, uh, it's not actually free. So we thought synergistically, you know, parallels to the business that we started 10 years ago, you know, other side of the balance sheet, a real compelling reason to actually do something meaningful for consumers. So if we were able to, you know, help 10 million consumers file their taxes each year, you know, that's some hundreds of millions of dollars of money that is going back into savings account that's not going to, uh, you know, to, to to tax return software, right? So for all of those reasons, we thought tax is a pretty powerful initiative. And over the course of the last six months, 
we went to the space, we bought a company, we, we scaled it to the extent that we could, and, and you know, we're, we're, we're excited to be in a spot where this year we'll do about uh, a million returns, and you know, that's pretty meaningful. We think that'll put us into number five or number six position in all of the DIY software uh, players in the space. And when you take a look at that top five, I think the median age of that incumbent group is probably about 35 years. So it's a group of people who've been doing it for a very long time. Um, sort of my interpretation of that is not a lot of innovation, um, you know, relatively sort of stifled and, and sort of uh, a captive audience or, or a captive set of players who play there and incumbents. And our goal is certainly to shake it up a little bit and do something more interesting. Okay, so you've, you've uh, done returns for a million people at, at this point? Yeah. Okay. And, um, and then I guess um, beyond, uh, beyond that, I guess going back to that first question is, so you're giving people free credit scores, your tax software, how do you make money? Sure. So we look at it as a lot of different ways, right? So our, our primary way is we help people get into better loan products today. So my textbook case of uh, a consumer on Credit Karma is maybe you come to Credit Karma because you're genuinely just curious about your credit score. When you register, we're able to see every trade line on your credit report. We're able to understand the credit history. We're able to understand whom you've borrowed money with, what interest rate you're able to borrow that money at, with or, or at. Um, but then at the same time, we actually have integrations with you know, most of the major lending platforms uh, and banks to understand at what rates they're lending. So you come on to Credit Karma, you have an auto loan at 19%, that loan might be 19% because you didn't shop, because you had poor credit at the time you took it out, but we'd instantly say, wow, you've got a 720 credit score, you're paying 19%, there's uh, you know, three players who are willing to give you a loan at 11%, 12%, and let's say 13%. The consumer says, I didn't know that, we do the math for them and say, well, one, one you'll save $75 a month, and another example, you'll save 85, and so on. Consumer picks the loan that they want. We help them through the process. Today, you still have to fill out some pieces of information. We certainly see a world in the future where a consumer doesn't have to fill any information out. They just have to consent, because if you think about it in the world and the strategy that we're going after, we're going to know your credit history. We're going to know your income. We're going to know what the asset is or the collateral is, so the car itself. So really the consent, the knowledge, and the consumer picking and the choice is really all we need to make a difference. So uh, in that world, uh, we help them find a, a lower cost loan. Consumer's happy because they came to Credit Karma to find out their credit score. They, uh, they find a, found a way to save $75 a month. Our banking partners are generally happy because they would spend several hundred dollars on television, on Facebook, on Google to find new customers. We were able to facilitate an extremely high quality consumer onto their platform. They pay us some form of that, and then we're able to take those dollars to provide more credit scores, more free tax services, and so on. So, you know, we think it's a pretty virtuous cycle. I mean, arguably, the only loser in that equation is the bank that was originally charging that consumer too much. And, you know, we don't particularly have a bunch of sympathy just because we think that's sort of a better efficient model. Okay, so so it is uh, I guess you're you're getting money from the people who are giving the loans, who you refer them to. Um, I, I guess, can you break down at all sort of how much you're making um, and, and you know, any breakdown on, on the sorts of loans that that's coming from? Uh, well, I mean, it, it varies, uh, so, you know. Or, and let's start with the overall kind of, you're, you're bringing in how much a year? Yeah, so I think, so, so, la so for 2016, we did a little bit more than uh, half a billion dollars in revenue, uh, so, and also about, you know, a little bit, about 50% revenue growth from the prior year. So it's a really meaningful business in the space, and I think that it just speaks to the opportunity. Banks spend an inordinate amount of money marketing their wares on a year-to-year -ba year basis, and again, through that, you know, television, Facebook, Google, radio, you name it. Um, so our platform facilitates an opportunity for them to be much more efficient, so they can find exactly the right type of customers they want, that they want. I mean, I think one of the big inefficiencies in marketing and financial services marketing specifically is that it's really hard to find the exact type of customer you're looking for, right? So imagine that you are a super prime lender in the space and you spend $100 million a year. Well, only a third of the US population is super prime, so you, you waste $66 million against a group that if they were even to apply in your site, you'd have to decline them. It's a terrible user experience. So we make it more efficient. So, that's our revenue model. Uh, that's sort of our average revenue. It varies in terms of what the you know, unit economics are. Uh, generally speaking, it's you know, uh, more expensive to get super prime users, and we 
we price appropriately, and it's a little bit cheaper on the on the separ uh, subprime side of it. Uh, in terms of verticals, you know, we have four verticals that we primarily monetize on today, which is credit cards, uh, personal loans, auto loans, and mortgages. Okay, so what, I mean, 10 years down the line, how big is the vision here? Are you gonna continue sort of rolling out piecemeal uh, free services? Obviously, tax feels like it's pretty separate from credit, I can see how they fit together, but what's the big vision here that unites that? Or sort of what are you driving towards? Well, I think if you look at the sort of the, the great innovations on the internet, you know, data being the common theme is that from a financial services perspective, it's historically been very challenging to service anyone who wasn't at the top 1% from a wealth perspective, right? You can have private bankers at that level. You can have literally someone who sits and watch your finances and tells you when rates change, tell you when a new market entrant comes in that might have, you know, better quality or better yield. It's hard to do that for the 99% because of scale. And I think that's where the technology, that's where credit card comes in. So we think about how do you build a digital assistant that can think about all those things, right? Who can actually look at you know, billions of data points and say, oh, there's you know, your, all of your credit components that really matter, all of your asset components that really matter, and in real time push out things that change. So for example, you know, if you've been maybe following our advice or you know, on your own imperative, you've, you've wanted to increase your credit score and your score goes up 40 points, well, that automatically makes you eligible for new loan products. So we monitor that on a day-to-day -day basis. We monitor not only your own credit score, but all the players in the space. And we would be able to instantly send out a notification that says, wow, your score's gone up 40 points, congratulations. That makes you eligible for X, Y, and Z loans. That will save you, you know, a, B, and C dollars, and the thumbprint is what we need to actually facilitate that transaction because we already know your name, your address, your income, your credit. And you know, I think that's a pretty powerful um, platform. That's a powerful tool. I oftentimes think about you know, the magic of, of ride share. To me, it's never been the fact that I can get my neighbor to drive me or I drive my neighbor. It's always been about the fact that that magical app was, you know, I could pull out my phone, push a button, car shows up. I get out, I never took out my wallet, and it seemed quite frictionless. And I think if you could do that for auto loans, if you could do that for mortgages, if you could actually move your dollars around to the place that gave you the biggest yield or the place that lowered your interest rate the most, think about how much more efficient financial services would be on a personal level. I mean, I think you, could, you, know, you, you might have to not detract or, or sort of take a step back from what it means from a banking perspective. I think banks will find ways to make money, but from a personal consumer perspective, I think that makes a world of difference. And that's really the platform that we're trying to build with Credit Karma, which is you know, very much one around helping consumers. And, and you know, we want to help everyone, but I'd say you know, the 99% are the most, most vulnerable, and that's where technology can really step in. And you know, our, our platform, I think, does like 2 billion models each day around the data points to understand what is going on in the space in terms of our users, what credit scores are changing, what, are our, you know, what to recommend, what people might be interested in. So, that's sort of the, the common theme that you see in the internet today, and we're very much focused on it from a technology perspective. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the thing that interests me about what you guys are doing and the, the, the potential there seems to be a sort of central place in a person's financial life where you can sort of monitor all your accounts and, and move between them and figure out what you should be doing. Um, I mean, do you think there is room for that? Do you think there is a, a room for that sort of central dashboard, or, or are there gonna always be 15 different apps that I have to go to, to, to do payments here, to figure out uh, you know, what's, in, what's in the checking account here, to, to monitor my investments here. I mean, how, how centralized do you think things can become? Well, I mean, there, there hasn't, I mean, I think in this space, there could be very much a winner takes all, winner takes most type of opportunity, right? And I think that historically, it's, I think part of the reason why the industry has not been particularly disruptive or innovative is because it's hard to get to scale, right? We have a lot of incumbents that make a lot of money in the space, and the only way to move the needle is to actually have the scale, the sheer number of users to actually facilitate change. So, you know, I think that ultimately this space will be dominated just like most verticals, right? If you think about whether that was search, whether it was about social, whether it was about e-commerce, you know, I think critical mass matters a lot. Economies of scale matter quite a bit. And ultimately, that behooves the data aspect of it. And for us, um, you know, we, we think that, sure, you know, credit scores are ultimately going to be a commodity. And for us, it was never about credit scores. It was about this ability to build a brand, to engage with consumers, 
to show the value proposition of what happens if you could build a business that was consumer-centric, not being adversarial to banks and financial institutions. And I think that for us, that's all the culminations of the product. So whether that is the tax returns, whether that's our ability to give you credit scores, and you know, probably the other half a dozen other ideas that our team is you know, working against, it's all in that common theme of if you get to scale, you have the most amount of data, you have the most amount of integrations, uh, you tend to have a pretty interesting ecosystem. And you see it in communications with you know, WeChat in China, you see that in social in you know, the United States with Facebook, and we certainly think that there's an opportunity to do something in the financial services world. How, um, I mean, how much harder is that in finance, you know, to create a sort of, I, I guess the way I think of it is a sort of search engine for financial products. I mean, I, I've just been through this. We've talked about this. I just moved, got a, uh, got a mortgage. And, you know, there is almost no transparency in this market to figure out, um, you know, what kind of interest rates are out there. Um, I mean, it's, it's kind of astonishing. And I guess I, I use Credit Karma, and even on Credit Karma, I didn't get much of a window into what kinds of loans, um, you know, what kinds of rates might be available. Um, I mean, how hard is that? How much are you pushing against, and how far is it, far are we from really knowing, you know, being able to, to figure out without going through the le loan process itself, which nobody wants to do, you know, what are, what are the rates that are really available to somebody? How, it seems like that's still quite a ways away. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that is the biggest challenge, right? I mean, I think this space is, moves at a glacial pace for the most part, right? Because there's not a lot of initiatives or impetus to, to create a lot of change. I mean, ironically, I mean, the, credit, the, the vision of Credit Karma is not very different than when it was 10 years ago. We've, I think we've come a long way from a scale perspective from some of our integrations, but you're absolutely right. So our, our mortgage product that you know, we talked about, it's, it's only you know, six months old. And it's six months old because we actually didn't like the way that transparency didn't exist in the space. We didn't like the way that there was still a lot of paper collection going around in the space. So we actually were a little hesitant to enter the space. We weren't sure of how much further and how much faster we could push the innovation envelope. But we realized if we didn't step in, then, you know, then, then it would still be a bunch of people calling you when you're looking for a mortgage rate. And the first person to call you oftentimes would get the business. So we thought, well, why don't we start somewhere? Why don't we actually start the, you know, sort of the transparency process? And how do we, going back to our overall strategy and this notion that data is ultimately um, the, the thing that will unlock the value for both credit karma and the consumer, how do we take the tax information, the credit information? The reason why uh, you, you know, it's, it's challenging today is you actually need 30, 40 data points to give you a relatively accurate quote process, right, in terms of your mortgage. Do you really want to do that at 10 locations? Well, our view is, well, you probably don't even do that at one location. Um, so how do we facilitate that on Credit Karma? Um, and then how do we take it so that we can actually give you as much of a transparent view into all the lenders in the space with as much ease and talking about that magical experience? So that's our goal. It's, it's slow. Um, it moves a lot slower than I particularly wanted to move. Uh, but it's also challenging because there's you know, GSEs, there's Fannie, there's Freddie, there's all these rules and stipulations around how this works. But with that said, I think that we have to continue to dream and move the ball forward. I mean, if, if, if you want to sort of think about breaking all this data open and, and making it available to people, you know, what rates can they really get on loans? What products could really be available to them? Or if there were one or two changes you could make in, with the lenders to, to break that open, what would it be? I mean, is it, is it, do they have the data? Do they have to make some change? Or are they just unwilling to provide that? Or what, what are the changes that need to happen to kind of you know, loosen that dam of data? Yeah, I think so it's a fascinating question, right? And, and our, our observation in the space is that you know, the opaqueness of everything in financial services or most things in financial services really revolves around this notion that everyone views their underwriting model um, as the secret sauce, right? It's why I think a lot of uh, you know, banks would say, this is why I make $5 billion or $20 billion a year is because I have this really proprietary uh, underwriting model. The problem with that is it's proprietary. No one actually knows how it works. So that is the thing that I think banks need to get comfortable with. Now, I think what Credit Karma is trying to do is to act as an intermediary, right? Our perspective is we don't care what your underwriting model is. We don't care about the secret sauce. We're not actually here 
to become a bank or lender. So we're not a competitor with you at the end of the day, right? What we're trying to do is unlock a value for consumers. Um, our data says something like 60% of loan applications get declined, right? And this is in a world where we have autonomous cars or nearly autonomous cars, and we still can't figure out, you know, six out of 10 times when you're not going to be able to approve for a loan product. So that's a real consumer issue. So unlocking and sort of our, uh, you know, if, if we had, uh, if we were in a king or queen for a day, we'd focus on this idea of, is there a way to solve that problem? Because if you could do that, then all of the rates become transparent. Then consumers have real choice. Then consumers understand that, oh, I actually have, you know, a thousand loan products that are available to me. And in the past, I would apply for two, maybe get approved or not, but now I can actually see all thousand. I can see all the interest rates associated with it. So that's, you know, is, really And amazing. is there something that you think is stopping that from being unlocked? You know, I think partly it's sentiment. I think it's partly trust. I think it's partly, you know, certainty of, of the unknown here, right? Um, you know, I think that everyone that we've spoken to uh, has a real fear of, like, what happens in that world if consumers were able, really able to understand credit underwriting. You know, I think it's pretty fascinating. So if you take a look at it, you know, four years ago, credit scores were all that mattered, right? Because the, the, the construct of a credit score was, you know, a loan officer would look at your credit report, you would be a loan officer, I'd be a loan officer, we might look at the same exact credit report and you might decline it, I might approve it, and the credit score was born because it was a jump, jump way to actually determine somebody's credit risk. Fast forward 40 years, we're in a space where big data really matters, credit scores don't really matter. So the credit decisioning is, you know, maybe 100, at times, a thousand data points. If you think about that from a consumer experience, it's a terrifying notion that there's a thousand things that determine your eligibility for a credit, and you actually have no visibility into how that works. So, you know, again, a little bit of our vision is, well, well if you solve that, um, isn't that what consumers are really asking for when they're asking for their credit score? Aren't they asking for, like, tell me what I can either buy today or buy in the future from a credit perspective, a financing perspective? And it's getting more complicated, not less. So our goal is to solve that problem. All right, so let's, let's talk about one sort of rub in your business, um, which is that, you know, I, I used Credit Karma when I was uh, going through this mortgage process and I found it was really helpful for sort of monitoring the credit score, thinking about how to lower it. Um, but when it came time to get recommendations from you guys, um, it felt a little bit like I was getting a few recommendations from the credit card companies that paid you guys to give me those recommendations. Um, and I, that, that was my assumption. Sure. You know, Credit Karma is getting paid by Capital One, and so they're recommending me a Capital One credit card. Um, I mean, that, that tension sits at the center of your business. How do you, how do you deal with that so that, you, so that a customer can feel like, I'm really getting honest advice that isn't just about, you know, who's paying Credit Karma. Sure, so we've always been very transparent. I mean, as I sort of described our business model at the very beginning, we make money from the banks, right? We, ha we help facilitate loans and that's how we get paid. And you know, as a company, we spend hundreds of millions of dollars on providing the service, the credit data, and so on. Um, our goal is to provide the very best offer. Now, the way that we currently do our ranking is we actually focus most importantly on your chances of being approved doesn't matter how great the rate is if you can't be approved. So that's the first thing that our algorithm looks at, is what are the probabilities that you're going to be approved. Now, just so happens that we know those best when we have volume, and we know that best when we actually partner with people who are reporting back approval and declinations. Now, that coincidentally happens to be partners who, uh, who, who pay with us, or, or, or sort of pay us or have a partnership. But our goal is to actually have every product on the platform, right? Ultimately, we don't care if you are the smallest credit union on the corner. If you have the very best product and the very best rates, our goal is long-term to have those particular products. So I think there's a little bit of a journey. Um, our goal is to, to make sure that consumers have as much choice as possible. But certainly, uh, you know, we worry a little bit about a free rider problem, right? Because if we made it completely free or if we didn't have a revenue component or if we didn't think about the partnerships, there's very much this a race to the bottom where no one is paying and we basically aren't able to provide the service. So there's an important balance here and, and I think a level of practicality that has to happen. So we try to, our, our solution to it is be very transparent, uh, make recommendations first on the probability of what you think you're, you're, you're going to be approved, secondary on the price of the product, and then third, if there's a tiebreaker, which is sort of the, you know, the payout to that particular product. And Not too dissimilar from Google. And, and, and will you recommend products where the company is not paying you to recommend it? 
we, we don't have a philosophy against it, right? We have not found products particularly that are price competitive that aren't marketing, right? So, so said another way, we have not found products that are the best in the market um, that are not marketing, right? So is there a product out there that's yielding 4% and from an APY perspective? We don't know about it. And if they were, like, we probably have them on our platform. Um, but it's always a balance. So another, I guess another, another thing to think about here with, on the consumer side is, you know, their financial health. And um, I, I mean, a, a lot of consumers, what they do not need is more debt. Um, and I, I, I was, I, using Credit Karma, there were times where I was offered, you know, a, a personal loan from Lending Club to consolidate my credit card debt. And I actually don't have, I mean, I just had my monthly revolving, you know, Debt, but I was offered, you know, take a loan out to, to finance this debt. Is that, I mean, how do you think about the financial health of the consumer and whether they need to take on more debt or whether they should take on more debt? So we have a perspective of <coughs> we, we never will promote a product that we think is worse for a consumer. So first and foremost, right? Now, I think also behind that, we actually think a lot about transparency. When we do comparisons, you know, we actually get criticism from, I, I've had, uh, investors like, why did you show me products that were like the math on mean like losing three hundred dollars? Because we wanted to be transparent about it. So our perspective is not to get people into debt. Now, I think in your specific case, in the example you're talking about, this is where better data helps us. Right now, some of our partners don't actually report whether or not, or in the credit bureau, whether you're actually a revolver or a transactor. Right? Meaning, we don't know whether or not you're carrying a balance month to month. So in that particular case, our model probably said we think Nathaniel is carrying a balance. We would assume it to be at 14, 15%. Here is a personal loan at 9%. I'm sure the, the, the calculation did the math for you. So that's an example where you ultimately more, need more data to make better predictions. So you know it's 2 billion calculations a day today. We could see it going to 10 billion in the future as we collect more data. So that, that, that recommendation can get more precise. And, and how, how far are you on the customer side from having enough data to make real you know, solid recommendations across the board, and how much more data do you need to get? I mean, if you get their tax, if you, right now you have their credit score, you have tax data on a, a million of the 70 million, um, I mean, how many more do you need to get? And, um, well, yeah, let, how far are you on that side? Well, I think it's pretty specific by use case, right? So I think that there's two ways of doing this. One is we can obviously continue to build out new products. The other is still actually self-reported information is pretty powerful, right? So for example, there could be a simple, I pay my, off, my, my credit card balance off in full each month, or I carry a balance. That actually gives us a piece of data to unlock the recommendations for you. So there's two ways to go and pursue it. Um, one, so, so that one is, you know, one we continue to add on features, but uh, you know, we, we think for some meaningful percentage of our users, we actually have a really great profile and we can actually be very precise in what we recommend and have a high degree of confidence. So for example, some of our auto loan partners or, or consumers who have auto loans, you know, we have models that are like, we are like 95% sure that they are overpaying for this loan by $200 each month. And you know, our goal there is, all right, product team, let's be particularly Aggressive, aggressive isn't the right word, but let's be really poignant about this idea that this person is really overpaying. So for that class of consumer, we're really sure, we're abundantly sure. And then I think there are a lot of others who are like, well, you know what, we actually only have credit score and credit report. We, have, we, we can't really triangulate, and then I think the recommendations get a little bit looser, but that's the value of over time building the asset. But it seems like you have consciously decided not to go the route of Mint and other aggregators where you just ask to log into people's accounts. You, you could go that route and you haven't. We actually have that feature. I mean, our observation in that space is that, you know, I can't imagine, I don't know of any company or person who's actually done that who's gotten past single digit penetration rates. I think the traditional, uh, the traditional budgeting tools has been a, you know, a single digit penetration type of use case. And we at Credit Karma, just to get to scale, we think about how do you actually affect tens of millions of people over time. So we could do that. I don't know if there's enough value in it from a consumer perspective today, uh, but we actually have the functionality. So for some percentage of our users, we have it. I wonder if it's actually a long-term you know, value proposition. Okay, last question. Um, when do you IPO? <laughs> uh, geez. Or how uh, long do you remain a private company? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm not trying to be coy, I actually don't know. I mean, I think that you, 
an IPO is a beginning, not an end, right? I think that really to be successful in the eyes of investors, in the eyes of your, your shareholders, in the, eyes, in, in the eyes of your employees, there has to be a long-term sustainability about going public. And I think that that's what we're ultimately optimizing for. So it's not like I'm trying to avoid the question, but you really want, hey, do we have great visibility into our, you know, into our revenue streams? Do we know what products that we're expanding into? Uh, you know, what do we think about the market? Those are all interments, and I think they're just a little bit too murky right now. So, um, you know, nothing this year for You're sure. Not planning. All right, great. Well, thanks so much. Thanks everybody for listening.